Welcome to Grappling with Gray, a forum for promoting an ethical mindset and ethical decision-making to help us more clearly see both sides of complex issues and better navigate the moral challenges of everyday life. I'm Rabbi Jonasen Goldson, and I'd like to introduce my guest today. With me is Jeff Eichler, who is the director of Quetty Code. Did I get that right? You did. Quetty Co. Executive Career and Personal Leadership Coaching, the host of the podcast Getting Unstuck, Cultivating Curiosity, and co-host of the podcast Cultivating Resilience, a whole community approach to alleviating trauma in schools. Kim Prize? Prize. Prize, I'm sorry. Kim Prize is co-founder, just the way it's spelled, uh, is co-founder of Counselor Connection LLC. He teaches computer programming, mathematics, engineering, and biotechnology, and he thrives on professional problem solving. And Stuart Wiggins is chief advisor at Induna Advisors, working to significantly increase company revenue by developing positive client reports and establishing solid business relationships. Gentlemen, thank you all for being with me today. And here Thanks for the is our, our pleasure. Education has become one of the most contentious fields on the battle of the culture wars. With the political right accusing the left of revisionism and indoctrination, and the political left accusing the right of revisionism and censorship. Professor Leslie M. Harris, a contributor to the 1619 Project, described in Politico how the New York Times grossly misrepresented her research and how critics exploited the misinformation to discredit legitimate parts of the project. An article in The Atlantic pondered whether the writers were merely negligent or willfully misrepresentative. The recently proposed Florida curriculum on Black history contained one line out of 191 points stating that slaves sometimes learn skills that help them. Representing one half of 1% of the total content, that single line was used to characterize the entire report as claiming that slaves benefited from slavery in an attempt to discredit the entire body of work. As a footnote, that line was included by a Black member of the Curriculum Commission. Florida legislation to restrict mention of sexual identity in the classrooms grades three and below was defended by supporters as ensuring age-appropriate education while condemned by opponents as homophobic and transphobic. It was branded the Don't Say Gay Bill. Also in Florida, despite state law requiring African-American studies, the government rejected a national AP curriculum, arguing that it advocated such positions as slave reparations and abolishing prisons, as well as emphasizing intersectionality, feminism, and gender identity with an intent toward indoctrination. In our polarized society, Many of us eagerly accept accounts and reports from news outlets we choose based on our political leanings, which makes it difficult to base our opinions on complete or even accurate information. What steps can we take to restore integrity to our educational system while respecting the sensitivities of both sides of the political spectrum and promoting a civil and informed national debate? I hope this topic gives us enough to talk about for half an hour. Easy. Struggle. <laughs> the floor is open. You know, I'd just like to lay, lay some groundwork on this, I think. And I, this, I'm passionate about this subject because I think everything that we do in our life is re related to our education system. Going back to the earliest days of our lives and how we teach people. And when you read the synopsis, it kind of suggests that. We don't teach people to ask questions. You know, the Socratic method is not designed just for, you know, college students and high school students or adult learners. You could do the very same thing with elementary age students. So my whole point is we don't people, to, we don't encourage people to ask questions, ask why, why? Or we uh, disparage people who ask a question that maybe somebody might say, well, that's a dumb question. And the greatest you say in the world that's actually very true is there's no such thing as a dumb question. So the whole point is we don't teach people to think. So they pick the organization they want to get their news, one source, and that suddenly becomes the, the truth. And they don't evaluate what they read, like the 1619 Project. They don't read to understand, do a deeper dive to understand. Now, I'm not saying that applies to everybody, but I think that 
a large part of our educational system discourages people or does not encourage people to understand more, to do the research and ask more questions. Also, there's, I would spent most of my career as an engineer, but the last 10 or more years as a professional teacher in the public schools. And I heard recently that Houston Independent School District is closing 20 libraries. So my immediate knee jerk response was, oh my God, this is terrible. It's up there with book burning. What the heck, you know, bad news. We shouldn't be doing this. Then I sat down and, and pushed my knee back down and thought about it for a second. And I realized out of a thousand students I saw in those years, I saw about three read a book. So I'm going, maybe the, the paper books in the libraries are, you know, maybe we don't need that so much anymore. There are other ways to get to books and there are other ways to get to information. You know, if I could just jump on that real quick, you know, I think that's modeled behavior though. I mean, when I was growing up, I saw my parents read. So then that's a behavior that I picked up and at really a young age because I started reading comic books at a young age. I can remember the crossing guard, there you go, see? The crossing guard actually gave my brother and I comic books and that's how we got into reading. But if you never see your parents read, then how does one realize that that's a behavior that could result in positive outcomes? Well, no. I, well let, me, right. let me just jump in. Um, I'm, I'm a former teacher as well and um, I used to use our high school library extensively with the kids. And um, I would hate, I would have hate to have lost that opportunity to get kids into the library to do whatever kind of research they could do at that age. And uh, just to follow up on, on Stuart's point, I, when I read the articles, Jonathan, uh, the one from uh, the independent, there was a line in there that uh, I, my jaw dropped. It was from Governor DeSantis. He says, I don't want the schools to kind of be a playground for ideological disputes. And that, that to me is shocking because, you know, Stuart raises the question, are we, are we, are kids asked to ask questions? Are they encouraged to ask questions? And it gets, it gets to a central point of mine which is we do not have agreement in this country about what we want our schools to be, what we want them to do. And I think, I think everything emanates from that, that we do not have a uniform agreement on, on the very basics of we want, what we want our schools to do. And as, as a former teacher, my goal was not to expect, I didn't expect my kids to memorize US history, names, dates, places, and things like that. My goal was to help them become thinkers because I thought they're gonna be leaving school soon. They're either gonna to go to college or into a trade. And I, want, I wanted them to have critical thinking abilities. That was my goal. And so we did we did a lot of asking of questions and we, re, we reversed it. Instead of me asking all the questions, I had kids asking each other questions. And we didn't look at, we didn't look at disagreements as, dis, as disputes. We looked at them as you've got a point of view, you've got a point of view, let's, let's talk about it. And I, I felt it was very healthy to get kids involved in, in that. Well, that's the way it should be. Um, I taught also for, for 20, for three years, I taught Jewish history. Um, and I have a 500-page book that emerged from my curriculum that I designed. Um, it has 20 chapters. Each chapter is broken into five or six sections, and each section begins with a question, and the questions overwhelmingly begin with the word, why? Because anybody can memorize names and dates. Exactly. But if you don't have context, then what good is any of it? But, you know, Jeff, to your point, it doesn't, doesn't it come down to a lack of trust? You know, the, the political camps, I think, don't trust each other. There's this feeling that each side believes the other side has an agenda and is willing to do whatever it takes to push that agenda. And therefore, there's an unwillingness 
to engage in debate because debate requires each side to believe in the integrity of the other side. I also think that date, debate takes a little bit of, uh, you, you have to be willing to listen. You have to be willing to accept the fact that maybe your position is not 100% accurate and it requires some thinking. And I always like to say thinking is hard. And that's why we that's why we have some of the problems we have because thinking is hard because you have to be able to do the research and form an opinion based on your own research and think to be able to articulate it in a in a sound fashion. I'd like to believe uh, Jonasson that what you're saying is true that it's it's based on mistrust or that there should be trust in in the system. I, I guess I've seen so much um animosity so much um unwillingness to sit down and and discuss issues that i'm not i'm not sure that we're there anymore I, th I think sure that we're ever there well there there was a time though i can remember i can remember you know i grew up uh came of age in the in the 70s and i can remember reading about senators who were on opposite sides of the aisle and they routinely collaborated with one another they would sit down and talk to one another and try to work things out and maybe we're not hearing about it today but that that that's not something i'm seeing going on today perhaps it was a less rude time and i grew up in the 60s young man so <laughs> Well, that makes me feel good, Kim. <laughs> I'm listening to the uh, the audiobook of Alexander Hamilton. I've been listening to it for a long time because it's a long book. Uh, but it's it's absolutely fascinating. But a lot of the the types of, of vitriol that we see now were played out then as well. I mean, a lot of it was vicious, and a lot of it was was disingenuous. But a point that I've made here before is that Alexander Hamilton and, and, and Thomas Jefferson, who were political and personal enemies um, in Washington's cabinet. And Washington didn't want to be president the first time. <laughs> he didn't want to finish his term. He didn't want to run for a second term. And they came to him and they both told him, you have to run because you are the only one who can keep the union together. And that I think is a critical difference between then and now. I don't think you would find anything like that today. The, the operative phrase, keep the union together. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, you have to believe in the union, first of all. And you have to believe in, in, in this experiment called democracy. And, but if you're only in it for yourself or for to make sure you have the most chips at the end of the day, zero sum, then it's, di it's difficult for you to believe in protecting the union. And, you know, we talked, you talked earlier about the fact that, you know, we wonder if any type of collaboration goes on behind doors. There's one proof positive thing that there's collaboration and that's bills. And there's no bills, there's no legislation. Because if there was legislation, there'd be collaboration to create those bills. But all it is is those, the, the, the fight to see, I can, me, 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 I'm the winner. Yeah, sometimes they can't even get out of committee to get to the floor for discussion. And that's that's a shame. I get a I get a, a daily newsletter from a historian. It's called Letters from an American. And her last name is Cox Richardson. And she's a historian uh, in New England. And what's been amazing, I've been reading her letters for about three years now, four years now. What's very interesting in how she writes is that what we're going through today, and Jonas, and this is kind of your point, is that we've been here before. We have seen these types of disagreements before, and there have been fundamental disagreements before. And, and this is this is not new, but the but the problem is a lot of the kids today are not getting that historic that historical perspective to understand that our country is a work in progress. 
It's aspirational. What they what they put into the founding documents is aspirational. And it's none of it is guaranteed. And it's it's a it's a work in progress. And you you don't get that perspective a lot of times because we're giving people sound bites of information. And we're we're not putting kids into a, a situation where they have to make uh, connections between historical periods. I don't think. But the, Jonathan brought up the Hamilton and Hamilton's interesting. And I, what I don't see in the history classes, even in high school, is debate about a central bank because we have generations now that have grown up with the Federal Reserve, which is effectively a central bank. And there are some of us out there <coughs> that don't exactly think the central bank is really that useful, to be honest. But that's another matter. That's my personal opinion. But the point is, I would hope students would go, well, what about a central bank? Why is that such a great idea? And then this would lead one thing to another to another. But you know, as well as I do, if you were in the public schools, you are teaching to the almighty God of testing. Exactly and not really covering education at all. And that's another topic of its own. I don't really want to venture into that area, area because I don't think that's what this discussion is about. But um, still, and I think this is a problem where, uh, that I've seen in some of the stuff coming out of perhaps distorted from Florida is my God, it sounds like they're changing the history books. Well. I remember the history books I had when I was a kid. And we had junk like Manifest Destiny, which was there, but it was taught as if it were something good. We had a movie called How the West Was Won yeah. with all this heroic yeah. white people stuff. <laughs> and I remember that movie and I go, oh my God, how could I watch this barf? So I'll shut up. But I think you make a good point, though, because, I mean, what I take from what you're saying is we've at least been able to be evolve beyond the conditions of the time to continue to grow. I mean, you know, we talk about going back to when the framers were about, you know, Jefferson and Adams at one time were friends and then they hated each other at the end, you know, dying only hours apart from each other. That's right. No, actually, I think at the end, at the end, they were very close friends again. Exactly, because they were writing each other. You're absolutely yeah. right. You're absolutely right. But the fact remains is that today, I'm not sure that could happen, where political rivals could end up being close. In fact, maybe the last ones that came to be close were George Bush and Bill Clinton. Um, because, and well, I'm talking there's about- There's Antonin Scalia and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. There you go. There's another example. They're famously close friends, radically different views. It can be done. It just isn't done very often. And I just wonder, I said this to a buddy of mine the other day, that before the proliferation of social media, I think that we were more able to have discussions with people that had different views and not hate them. Yeah. But because it, it really just didn't come up in conversation, or maybe it was polite conversation. But with social media, everybody just either has to be on this side or that side. And if you're not with me, you're against me, and I hate you. Now they have well, there's point. no nuance. And there's, there's this, um, you know, there's no time to think. Uh, you, have to, you have to fire off your, your responses right away. And then, then there's the, the tribalism. If you go against your tribe, they'll attack you. So it's not safe to even articulate that maybe there is another dimension to what's being said. You know, Jonathan Haidt, among others, um, says that, that uh, conservatives and liberals need each other because both are not necessarily in the, in the contemporary way they're used, but in terms of, of authentic political philosophies, both are defensible, reasonable ways of looking at the world. You need to be founded in tradition. You need to be looking forward to how to improve and change. And by engaging one another, both have to stay honest. Now, when there were three news networks, they had to appeal to a broader audience so they couldn't be too radical. But 
if there's no willingness to talk, to discuss, to engage somebody, rather you just vilify the person on the other side. But you know, when we started off talking about education and we quickly moved into politics, <laughs> is, uh, we can, is we our can. educational are there educational problems just another manifestation of our political problems? Yes, they are. Yeah. And the, part of the reason for that is most public schools and to some extent, some of the private schools come under, what is it, Title 11 or something like that, where they get their funding from the federal government. The instant they have funding from the federal government, they're influenced by whatever the federal government tells them to do. So uh, there's only one state that I know of in the United States that does not accept that money. What is it, Title 11 or Title 1? I can't remember. Anyhow. Um, and that's New Hampshire. And of course their license plate says live free or die, right? But uh, it, it's, it's a problem because we get in, I'm in Texas, which is state is huge. We're the ninth largest economy in the world. And once the politicians get involved, we have courses like free enterprise taught by teachers who uh, pontificate about socialism while being public school employees. Huh? There's something wrong with that picture. They're they're under public money. So uh, I, this kind of rages back and forth. Where does it end? Well, I was lucky enough to be in uh, science-oriented stuff, so I didn't have too much conflict. But uh, well, that could get teachers, teachers, or, each of you were teachers. You have to believe that by definition, teacher, that's what you were supposed to do. You know, and some of that may require some of your opinion based on your experiences, particularly if somebody asks you a question about something. You know, so I, I still contend what I said at, at the outset. Education is literally a problem solver for, for so many things that exist because we talk about politics, but I think most people were more moderate. I mean, if you, if, if you looked at a bell curve, there's, you know, the, the number of people on the left and the number of people on the right don't equate to the number of people that are right there in the middle. But yet we have these tribes that say you're either this or you're either that. Right. The conservatives and liberals, they need each other. But I, I suggest that we also need a moderate camp where people to come down in also. Well, I, I'm... I'm uh... I, I'm I'm I feel very strongly that our two party system is not serving us anymore. <laughs> right. So so I was uh, after I left teaching, I was in uh, the the educational publishing business and educational publishing in the United States is a business for the most part. It's a. Um, it's a marriage of art and commerce. And the art is to develop coherent learning materials, textbooks, technology, be they online more so now than they, than, than they were years ago. But what was very interesting to be in that, in that arena was education is largely run by the states in the United States. It, it's a state purview. And we were developing textbooks for Texas, Kim, and for California, that would be different based on their standards. Now, there would be overlap, but sometimes there were, there were major differences. And if you wanted to sell your book into Texas or into California, you had to adjust your content accordingly. There were times, I remember, especially in the area of science and biology, where we said, no, we're not going to do it. We're not going to change it because it ran counter to what we believe. But this, this also gets back to my original point is that we don't have agreement. We can, we can look at our US history and states want to teach it differently. They want to put a different emphasis, emphasis on it. We want to teach science, but certain states want to teach it differently. Kim, to your point about economics, I developed a textbook um, and I was working with a Texas author and he was radically different than some of the critic readers that I had on the program. And trying to balance somebody who was born, raised, fed on free enterprise versus some of the other opinions, it was, 
it was not always fun. So it's this it's this constant tug about well what what is it that we want to try to accomplish? And I was looking at at your two bios, and I'm just curious, Kim, you you thrive on professional problem solving, and I've always Indeed. felt that's that that's what I feel we should be helping kids to become is problem solvers. We've got real issues in this country. Yes, and we, we, sh we should be putting problems in front of them, not necessarily to solve, but to have their own their own views on it and to to dig into things. And Stuart, you you establish solid business relationships. We should be helping kids with emotional intelligence. How do you how do you understand yourself as a person? How do you understand other people? How do you get along with other people? And there's there's always a hue and cry whenever you talk about emotional intelligence or social emotional learning that the schools have to stay away from that. But don't we want our, our kids, don't we want to get along like the four of us have been talking about to be able to discuss issues civilly? Well, wouldn't it be nice to ask questions? I got nasty one day and I asked the kids to give me a physical representation of minus three minus threes. And what I got was the ideology. Well, a negative times a negative is positive, right? And I said, prove it. Oops, so dead silence. That nice thing about that little exercise was the two people that answered it best. One had a C in my course, was a young lady and she used colors to represent it. And the other one was a special education student and he used valence. Valence. chemical valence, which was, its solution was brilliant, far better than anything I had in mind. And when I when we had to do an ARD, which is a uh, dismissal type thing in the sense of does he stay in the program or not, where I'm later, they asked me what I thought, how I thought he'd do. And I said, that guy will do great. He's an original thinker. There you go. And that's what that's what I wanted to see. Original thinkers. And that's Actually, what yeah. I don't think, I, people are so worried about the, all these ideologies and meanwhile, these kids can't do anything. Yeah, you've probably heard being in education that the, uh, the A students often end up working for the D students because they become the lawyers and the accountants uh, and the ones who struggle in school are the ones who are the out of the box thinkers that go figure out some whole new way approach uh, and all new approach to life and, and business. There's actually research on that. Well, I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I was just going to say that, you know, we want people. I'll give you an example. Yesterday, this guy that won the Medal of Honor. I don't know whether you saw that on the news yesterday. He, the way he saved those soldiers was he put them all out on the landing legs of that uh, helicopter. And it wasn't designed for that. And he saved them all. So he was a, he thought outside the box, figured out a way to save himself and to save those soldiers. That's why he won, won the Medal of Honor. I'm not going to say that guy was a D student, but that was a guy that was figuring out how to solve problems. Right. And when we talk about education, you know, if you stand up there and just spit it out at somebody and then you expect them to regurgitate it back, I'm not sure they're solving problems. But if you ask questions and then you ask them why, or like the special needs student you have, I say bravo. Because I've always advocated that you shouldn't put people in groups. You should put the high performers with the medium and low performers. And guess what? I think that the low performers and the medium performers get pulled up because the high performers are there with them. A lot more work for the teachers and the teachers have to be tra trained to be able to deal with a situation like that. And in industrial education, um, teachers are often flying by the seat of their pants. Well, we said it earlier, it's testing. You know? well, there's so that there's it's testing. Evaluated, you're evaluated by the test. Yeah. yeah, there's testing, and then there's an imaginary creation called core courses. Mm -hmm. You know, math, science, English, and social studies. Like the rest of them are art and uh, things like that, or some something beneath core courses. Yeah. yeah. And, and so on. And the fact of the matter is, is I had a principal tell me once I was in career in technology and she said, it's your classes are the ones that get students to come to this high school. 
they can get jobs with your classes. Right, exactly. Yeah. Well, we're working off a model, an educational model that's 150 years old. It was yes. based on the Industrial Revolution. And we, are, we, are, we were to produce kids like we were producing machines. They sat in rows, they answered to bells, they were, they were organized by um, um, their, their smarts or their intelligence, as opposed to, Jonas, and your idea of integrating them, where you've got certain kids who are maybe testing at a higher degree with kids who are not, and, and the ones who are testing at a higher degree can work as almost as mentors in the class. But instead, we've, we continue this regimentation of, of education with core courses, the Carnegie units, and research shows that curiosity, creativity drops precipitously from grade three through high school. Now, why is that? But we're not, we're not solving that problem. So we're producing, we're having kids walk across the stage for their diploma who don't, who don't necessarily have the capability to solve your problem, Kim, or the one that you proposed, um, Stuart, that the Medal of Honor proposed. You know, this goes back, Jeff, to the point you made a couple of times, which is that it, it's, it's the, there's one way of looking at things. And you know, I, I've, I just started reading, finally, um, Founding Brothers, the Pulitzer Prize winner by uh, Joseph Ellis. And, and it's fascinating because what he does is he lays out how the whole country was built on ideological contradiction and paradox. Radically different, whether it's slavery and free or, or federalism and, 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 uh, and, and dem democratic philosophy, you know, it goes through these, these fascinating anecdotes out of which you get this sort of mosaic of, of what it was like. And, and his whole premise is that these are not meant to be solved. They are meant to be managed and to coexist. So on the one hand, we need those core um, subjects. I mean, my, my oldest daughter was ruined by something called whole language. <laughs> just, just let them write and don't worry about whether they're punctuating or spelling. I mean, she, <laughs> you know, she was in college before she could write normally again. <laughs> <laughs> but on the other hand, you need that creativity. You need that flexibility. Um, you know, I was fortunate teaching in a private Jewish school that I wasn't tightly bound by a curriculum. And, and my yeah. students would tell me and still tell me years later, you know, we learned more from you going off on tangents than we did in any of our uh, core classes. Right. Because it's related. Listen. To what's going on in their lives, what's going on in the world, and, and, and make it real and interesting. Yeah, Jonas, and it's a good point. It, it's not that the core subjects are inherently bad, it's how they're taught. Like, for example, a few years ago, um, there was something introduced called Common Core. Yeah. And it was Common Core for Language Arts and Common Core for Mathematics. And what Common Core for Mathematics said is you have eight mathematical practices. That, that really define mathematical thinking. And five of those required kids to explain their answer. And what was important about the Math Common Core was, yes, we want kids to get the answer, but what we're more interested in is how they think, yes. is, is what route they took to solve the problem or to get an answer. So that was not the way my algebra course was taught. I always wondered, how am I going to use these formulas going forward, you know? But common, common core math made a lot of sense to me because it was asking kids to become thinkers about how to solve problems. What age do they start teaching them? I mean, how young are they? Say it again. At what age do they start teaching that, the common core? I, I don't know, because here's the reason for my question. Because if we start teaching it at a younger age, teach people to think because what happens is if we give them a test when they first get in school first or second grade and we say okay you're a slow learner you become a slow learner you never get a chance to realize your potential so no, common, core, common core was starting at three okay yeah i had no idea yeah and it was and it was vilified in parts of the country oh we're not having kids get the right answers you know and 
all this talk about how to figure things out. You know, that wasn't the way I learned mathematics, but it made it to, to many of us, it made huge sense because we were trying to get kids to think. Different. Yeah, there again, I, I still remember um, one of my, my less uh, favorite memories as a parent um, is when my son came home and asked me to help him with his math homework. Uh, he was probably, I don't know, fourth or fifth grade, maybe. And I, I said, okay, let's sit down. Here's the question. So how did the teacher teach you to approach this question? She didn't. Said, no, seriously, what did the teacher say? No, she didn't tell us anything. I got mad at him. I said, no responsible teacher would just give you a question and expect you to solve it with no guidance. Well, that was exactly what happened. Um, it was one of these new philosophies where just let the kids experiment. And that's fine as long as you give them some kind of a starting point, <laughs> some kind of tools, some kind of direction, then let them experiment. It's that balance. Yeah. You know, I, it's pretty quantifiable. I'm not sure I know about just let them experiment. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you can well, do that part of the time until you have to test. And then if, <laughs> if you haven't, you haven't trained them for that. You're probably not going to have a job in about two years. I'm not kidding. I, you want to hope that guy that built that, that designed that bridge, wasn't just experimenting. <laughs> 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 that his numbers were in the right place. That's yeah. another ethical discussion. <laughs> well, you know, the, in in the in the uh, in the Torah observant world, the the main course of serious scholarship is focused on the Babylonian Talmud. Now there's also a Jerusalem Talmud. Talmud is a collection of the discussions and the debates of the sages about applying the, the oral tradition to practical law. And the Jerusalem Tal Talmud gives you, here are our conclusions. This is the law, this is what you do. And the Babylonian Talmud says, here's the way we figure out what's going on often with no conclusions. And that's our major course of study, because when you understand how the system works, then you're in a position to always be able to figure out, because there are always going to be questions that don't get addressed directly. There are always going to be new situations that arise that weren't addressed in the older books. And the willingness to be able to look at both sides of an issue and struggle with it and come up with perhaps two polar <laughs> approaches, each of which has intellectual integrity, and then say, okay, we've got different approaches. Now, let's figure out where we go from here. But I think it really comes back to that willingness to have a little bit of humility, to acknowledge that the other side may have legitimate points, and to always be asking questions, and to be seeking new ways of working towards the answers together, as opposed to this tribalized as approach of let's try to beat the other side into, into submission. I love it. I will say this, I think that the people I try to surround myself with, and I, I would, I'm going to put that out to you guys too, because you guys seem like you're, you're very curious. I like to be around people that are curious, people that are going to ask questions. And um, I mean, that's why I like doing these types of things, because you know, I get to hear, hear different perspectives. And Jeff, I think you said it early on about curiosity. I, when, I, when I'm hiring people, I look for people who are curious, because I can teach them the fundamentals, but if they're curious enough, not to settle with the status quo. Those are people that I think can be very successful. Yeah, Stuart, the, the last question I asked on my podcast, um, I call it rotating the mic. And my guest gets to ask me the last question. And they don't know that, they, unless they've listened to uh, podcast episodes before, they don't know that that question is coming. And I've got many people who say, wow, I've never had the opportunity to do that on an interview, you know, but to your point, that's what we want our candidates to do during an interview, right? We want them to be asking as many questions as we're asking them. 
Tim, you have a final word for us? Uh, the I love your Babylonian Talmud example so much. I'm just sitting here kind of stunned. I, <laughs> I, I, I knew that if you take a Babylonian Talmudic scholar and a Jesuit and put them in the same room, let's watch the sparks fly. <laughs> Well, I haven't had that experience myself, but uh, uh, <laughs> be happy. Well, gentlemen, we have not solved the world's problems, but uh, maybe we've brought them into a little better focus <laughs> and hope these kinds of conversations can lead us in the right direction. So, uh, Amen to that. Nice chatting with you all. Yes. Jeff good, Eichler, good topic. Kim Fries, Stuart Wiggins, thank you for your time, your thought your intellectual integrity. And uh, I hope we will uh, have future conversations together. Thank Indeed. you. For those of you who are watching or listening, if you have a topic you'd like us to take up, please go to my website, ethicsninja.com. Use the contact information, submit your idea. If it's compelling, we'll definitely take it up in another episode. And until then, we encourage you to always continue grappling with the gray.